thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm Ash Parker at Hancock County Library System. Today we're being joined by Greg Johnson to talk about Mississippi's musical diversity. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction, then I'm going to turn it right over to you, Greg. Uh, Greg Johnson holds a, the position of Blues Curator and Professor at the Department of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Mississippi. He oversees the library's large collection of blues sound recordings, videos, posters, books, magazines, and ephemera. He also works to curate collections and organize, preserve, and make them accessible to the public. Greg is the co-author of 100 Books Every Blues Fan Should Own, published in 2014, and is a past president of the Society of Mississippi Archivists. We're very excited to have you here today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us, Greg. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to speak with you today. So give me just a second to share my screen. Um, okay. So I am just going to dive right in and I want to give this disclaimer up front that uh, I'm talking about a lot of different styles and uh, a lot of people have some very strong opinions about Mississippi uh, musicians and artists and uh, I'll probably leave one of your favorites off. So if I do, I apologize in advance. Um, you can complain to me afterwards. Um, so I'm just showing a lot of these the scans you're going to be seeing are things from um, our collections here uh, in archives and special collections at the University of Mississippi. Um, I want to begin today's talk uh, looking just very briefly at some native music from Mississippi. Uh, this is uh, this map is a, a 1763 map, um, sometimes called the Buffalo map. You can see the stylized <laughs> little buffalo in the right lower right hand uh, part there. Um, here's a, another uh, map. This is a facsimile. It's 1766, kind of showing some of the uh, the different uh, native uh, tribes uh, in the in our region. So I want to. It's interesting. The very first recordings we have, uh, the oldest recordings we have of a Native American music in Mississippi, were done by this woman, uh, Frances Densmore. Um, she is from Wet Red Wing, Minnesota, and um, she began work with the uh, with the Smithsonian's uh, Bureau of American Ethno e Ethnology in 1907, uh, and through that work, she recorded over 50 uh, wax cylinders. So you may know that Edison, Thomas Edison invented the process to record and playback audio in 1877. And audio was done on these these wax cylinders. You can see one of the cylinder recorders in the in this photo. Um, and she came to Mississippi uh, in 1933. Actually, she did a lot more than 50 cylinders. She did 50 cylinders uh, of recording in 1933 in Mississippi. She was in, went to uh, Philadelphia, uh, Bochito, um, and near the uh, Pearl River, and uh, made some recordings there. So. We can hear. So a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of songs have different. Um, significance to, to, to different tribes or different songs of, that accompany certain practices. There's a, uh, there's a dance called the snake dance that has certain moves and, and, and uh, singing that accompanies, accompanies that. There's songs that deal with planting of the corn, all, all, all type, all manner of things that are involved in just everyday life. Uh, we can talk more about that later, but I want to get through a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of material today. So here we go. I think uh, before I get into talking about different types of music, I want us to look at uh, just songs about Mississippi or that mention Mississippi. Uh, there's a lot of sheet music that's been published with the word Mississippi in the title. Um, people like playing off of that word, like with titles like I miss that Mississippi miss that misses me, um, Mississippi, that grand old state of mind. Um, yeah, there's uh, a lot of a lot of songs like this. There's um, sometimes uh, some people refer to 
a lot of um, sheet music from this time period, particularly like uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, a lot of sheet music that was printed about Mississippi or about the South. Uh, they call it Moonlight and Magnolias <laughs> uh, because so many of the Im images have, they'll have photos of magnolia trees on them or a moon over the Mississippi River or some lake. Uh, I mean, it's just hundreds and hundreds of pieces like that. And the ironic thing is most of these pieces were written by recently arrived European immigrants to uh, New York who had never once visited the South <laughs> writing, uh, writing songs in Tin Pan Alley uh, with these just, you know, nostalgic views of these places they've never been to. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of uh, songs are just silly, <laughs> silly, uh, silly titles. Um, the Mississippi Dippy Dip is a dance. Uh, the sheet music actually has a little diagram showing some of the dance moves for it. Um, yeah. Mrs. Sippy, you're a grand old girl. You can see all of these. <laughs> um, here's one. A lot of people, when they're, no matter what state people grow up in, so many people have memories of, of learning little songs involve the name Mississippi, not their own state. M I S S I S S I B B I. That used to be so hard to spell. <laughs> uh, lots of songs celebrating, um, you know, important figures from Mississippi, uh, General Quitman, uh, songs about Mississippi Legionnaires. Go oh, Mississippi, oh, wow. here is Keep Rolling I just Along. This is our current state song. Go Mississippi, you cannot be wrong. Go. So. Uh, this song, uh, this was adopted as the state song in 1962. Um, the song was re received uh, at its unveiling uh, to great enthusiasm by fans at the Ole Miss Kentucky game. Uh, there was a dedication in September 1962 by Ross Barnett. Um, the Ole Miss marching band um, played it during the halftime show. Now it's interesting, the composer here, Houston Smith, um, he had written another song before this uh, with the, the music's exactly the same. He just changed the words. He wrote the campaign song, the 1959 campaign song for Ross Barnett called Roll With Ross. Um, some of the lyrics of that song, I mean, it's, it's very much so, uh, you know, Ross Barnett, if, if you know anything about our state's history, the staunch segregationist. Um, some of the lyrics are roll with Ross. He's, uh, he's his own boss. He's for segregation. 100%. He's not a moderate. Like some of the gents he'll fight integration with forceful intent. Um, so that song was the basis, <laughs> uh, for they, for, uh, go Mississippi. Um, the lyrics were just changed, but the music is exactly the same. It's interesting. The dedication of that song was on September 29th. Uh, 1962. That was very intentional. This was all part of anti-integration efforts. This was the day before uh, James Meredith uh, enrolled as, as the first African American student uh, to to be admitted to the University of Mississippi. Um, so yeah, this was. Um, there's a lot more I could go into on that, but so I just discovered that just this week, um, within the past week. The governor signed uh, a new state song. I, I didn't know this uh, until actually this morning. I was uh, looking this back up. And um, so uh, Steve Azar's uh, song, One Mississippi, will become the official new so state song of Mississippi starting July 1st, um, sort of the new fiscal year, I guess. So um, anyway, so, you know, when visitors are driving into our state, uh, we're welcomed by these these big signs, uh, the Mississippi welcome signs that say, welcome to Mississippi, birthplace of America's music. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. 
uh, we are, I mean, we have Tupelo is uh, the birthplace of Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Uh, we have the blues from the Mississippi Delta and the North Mississippi Hill Country region. We have Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music from Meridian. Uh, so three huge pivotal uh, genres uh, that have formed the backbone of much of uh, American music right here in the state. Something uh, something a lot of us are, are very proud of. Um, it's a photo of B.B. Uh, King and, and Elvis. Um, that was uh, an Ernest uh, uh, Withers uh, photo, photographer from Memphis. Uh, Muddy Waters, you know, <laughs> Uh, the famous uh, blues, electric blues singer um, from the Delta. Um, you know, he he famously sang once uh, the blues had a baby and they named him rock and roll, talking about how influential the blues was on the development of rock music. Um, years later, the uh, music critic Francis Davis added to that. He said, yeah, and when the, uh, the brat grew up, he threatened to kick the old man out of the house, <laughs> uh, referencing so many rock bands that just blatantly ripped off blues artists. That's one narrative. Uh, there's all, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, uh, and I could talk about that some too. But yeah, we have, a, so again, these are scans of some things from our collections. This is a scan of one of our, we have five original Robert Johnson uh, 78s at 78 RPM, the sound recordings there in the archive. Um, this is me and the devil blues. This is a uh, Charlie Patton 78. So um, a lot of people need to know more about Willie Dixon. I mean, he was a bassist, uh, band leader, songwriter uh, from Vicksburg. I mean, all of these songs, these big hits, or just some of what, what he, uh, he's written. He was very prolific. Almost all of the, uh, the big Chicago blues artists, their big hits were all songs that he wrote. <laughs> um, incredible uh, songwriter um, and amazing bass player as well. Uh, Bobby Gentry, Ode to Billy Joe. Um, so many great artists out of the state. Charlie Pride, um, Marty Stewart and his fabulous, fabulous superlatives. Um, uh, Marty Stewart's from uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, there's a big ex exhibition of his works, uh, some of his collection uh, that's opening up soon. Um, I think May 7th, and um, that will be at the two Mississippi museums down in Jackson. So I urge people to go check that out if you get a chance. Uh, Bo Diddley, got some great artists from all over the state. Mose Allison, uh, Jimmy Buffett from down in, in Y'all's Neck of the Woods, then uh, I guess Pascagoula, is that right? Uh, a lot of pop artists. <laughs> Uh, from the state. A lot of people don't associate, they associate Britney Spears with uh, Louisiana. She, she moved there very early on, but uh, was born, I believe, in Macomb. Uh, Blind Melon, uh, big band in the 90s, um, has uh, roots in Mississippi, as do Three Doors Down. Um, the, uh, the rap artist Big Crit uh, from Meridian, um, I mean, we've a lot of artists all over. That this is uh, one story that's not often told about the state uh, is the rap and hip hop scene. Uh, this book, um, "Let the World Listen Right," deals with a lot of the with the hip hop and rap in the Mississippi Delta. So often, you know, we get into this binary thinking a lot of times. We're thinking about the state and places, and when you think about the Delta, people only think blues. <laughs> you know, uh, but it's it like every other region is uh, is much more. Uh, diverse. Um, Chris Etheridge, featured on the right here with the uh, Flying Burrito Brothers and many other groups from, from Meridian. Um, so um, Edgar and Johnny Winter uh, from Leland, uh, Mississippi. Um, not the most famous musician from uh, Leland, Mississippi. Uh, that would be this guy right here. Uh, so Jim Henson is from uh, from Leland. And if you've ever visited Leland or some of the other areas in the Delta, you see all the cypress swamps and you see clearly where Jim Henson got the inspiration for Kermit the Frog uh, growing up in, the, in his swamp. A um, lot of great songwriters uh, from the state. And in the upper left, that's Jim Weatherly. 
most famous uh, for writing the song Midnight uh, Train to Georgia. Uh, Gladys Knight and the Pips covered that. Um, in fact, uh, tomorrow night, the University of Mississippi is honoring, po posthumously honoring Jim Weatherly um, for his contributions to, to American music. Um, so I'm going to be uh, attending that event, looking forward to it. And Jim Weatherly is also going to be the recipient of a Mississippi uh, country, uh, country Music Trail marker later this fall. Uh, he's from Pontotoc, Mississippi. Uh, Craig Wiseman uh, is the other gentleman uh, on this slide. Um, in addition to being uh, one of my church camp counselors <laughs> when I was a kid, um, Craig Wiseman uh, is from um, Hattiesburg. He, gosh, this guy has written around 30, probably more number one songs um, on the Billboard uh, country music charts. He's written, you know, number one and, you know, best-selling popular songs for like Faith Hill, Kenny Chesney, Tim McGraw, Leanne Rimes, Trace Adkins, Toby Keith, Blake Shelton, you name it. Um, 2009, he was awarded Songwriter of the Decade by the Nashville Songwriters uh, Association International. Um, and also, so down in your area, uh, in Gulfport, uh, I found this out last year. Um, Art Tripp, chiropractor there, um, he was one of the first percussionists with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, that's just fascinating. This is, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I was a huge, uh, Zappa fan when I discovered like, wait, he's a chiropractor on the Mississippi Gulf coast. What? Uh, here's some photos of art, art trip performing with, uh, with Frank Zappa. He performed with, uh, Captain Beefheart and, uh, and some other experimental, uh, progressive rock musicians. Um, Walk right in, then ride down, and baby, let your mind roll on. Hey, walk right in. Um, walk right in, covered by many, many. But then you you know, be, be too long. And Gus Cannon, uh, uh, Gus Cannon was uh, born in Red Bay. This is to be up in the northern part of the lake. Hey, walk right in. Walk right in. Um, so uh, let's move over to Pontotoc again. So I mentioned Jim Weatherly was from there, but uh, this woman, Cordell Jackson, uh, was also from Pontotoc. She lived 1923 to 2004. And uh, she is an amazing uh, rockabilly uh, guitarist. Yeah, pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, yeah, I only discovered her about five years ago and I was just blown away. Um, some people call her the, uh, you know, the, uh, the rockabilly uh, granny. <laughs> Lots of uh, fun, fun names uh, for her. So let's go uh, way back. I'm, I'm just giving us a broad survey uh, right now. Um, this, uh, this guy pictured here, this is uh, Howard Odom. He was a, uh, he studied uh, classics and uh, I believe he was taking a sociology course here at the University of Mississippi in the first decade of the, uh, night, um, the early, early 1900s. And while he was taking a sociology course, he did some work where he went around um, the state. Uh, well, actually when focused his, all of his recordings in uh, Lafayette County, uh, that's the county that, that Oxford is in. Uh, and he recorded all these examples of black folk music. Um, and it's very clear from his writings, the music, what he described on these recordings uh, was sounds a lot like uh, the themes he was describing and some of the content of the songs sounds very much like he was describing blues music. Unfortunately, um, between the time he, we, don't, we just don't know, he sent these cylinders to one of his co-researchers uh, a person named uh, Guy Johnson, I believe at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, and they got the information they needed for the study and then the cylinders just are lost or destroyed or just who knows. But this would be the holy grail of blues because 
these would have been possibly recordings of blues uh, a couple of decades before really commercial blues uh, were recorded. Um, fascinating. Yeah, he was a principal at Takapola High School, which is a little community right outside of, of Oxford. Um, so this is uh, Mississippi Fred McDowell um, from Como, Mississippi. That's just about a little over 30 miles sort of uh, west, uh, west slightly north of, uh, of Oxford. Um, very, uh, very influential on a lot of the North Mississippi Hill Country blues artists. Here's some footage that a um, guy named Christian Garrison, who worked in the education department here at, at the University of Mississippi, uh, made in the uh, 1960s. Oh, why did it bounce? Hmm. One second. This footage was used, some of this was used by um, Scott Beretta and Joe York uh, in their uh, documentary they did a few years ago uh, called Shake Em On Down about uh, the life of Mississippi Fred McDowell. And I encourage you to pick that up. Oh, that 61 highway, we've been long and road Well, that 61 highway, We've been long and road, I know. Um, so yeah, when a lot of people that don't really that are just that have limited knowledge about the blues, they think they really focusing just on uh, the Mississippi Delta a lot of times when they're thinking about the state. But uh, the North Mississippi Hill Country region has its own sort of distinctive style of uh, blues and is home to some very prominent um, and, and very important blues musicians such as R.L. Burnside, uh, seen here. Um, Jesse May Hemphill, who lived uh, a lot of her life in the Senatobia area. Um, people like uh, Junior Kimbrough uh, and their extended families uh, from this region. Um, Cedric Burnside uh, won a Grammy recently, uh, is, uh, part of this, this family. Just a little snippet of uh, the song Jumper on the Line. See my jumper, Lord, hanging out on the line. A lot of hill country blues uh, folks stays in sort of See one tonality. Jumper, Often there aren't four changes, like line. Delta blues and Chicago blues. A lot of blues typically have a three chord structure. A lot of the hill country blues, it's just one chord. You can get a dance through it. So a lot of hill country blues has some influence from the uh, African-American fife and drum tradition. Um, uh, this is Otha Turner on the, pictured on the right here uh, with this rising star fife and drum band uh, from uh, Gravel Springs, Mississippi, uh, near Como. Um, and this music has roots in both the uh, fife and drum bands, the military fife and drum bands, dating back to, even to like maybe the Revolutionary War um, in, in the United States but also uh, their African drum and dance traditions from West Africa, uh, the areas around like Togo, Ghana, and Benin uh, that have an influence on the development of the style of music. Um, here's a brief sample from one of the... Uh, uh, one of the picnics that Arthur uh, is famous for throwing. Often you'll see a lot of blues festivals around the state. They get started with, um, with fife and drum music, kicking things off. Um, and it's often, um, often it will be, uh, um, I'm sorry, head, headed by his granddaughter, Charday, uh, Charday Thomas, who heads the Rising Star uh, Fife and Drum Band, uh, who's really carrying on um, this, this whole tradition. So this photo, this is Napoleon Strickland demonstrating a, a one string. Sometimes we'll call these diddly bows. Uh, in this case, he's taken a piece of wire, nailed it to the side of a building, propped it up to create tension on it. Um, and he's playing it with a bottle here. Um, these are called diddly bows sometimes when they're in an instrument form. This is uh, Lonnie Pitchford playing one. Uh, do a little, play a little snippet of, of him playing one of these. 
So a lot of people, uh, musicians, when you know they were young, maybe their families couldn't afford to buy uh, an instrument. So you have to get creative, and you create instruments out of anything you might have have around. Uh, that is some footage um, from the Association for Cultural Equity. Uh, this was filmed by Alan Lomax in 1978. Um, yeah, this is uh, Sam Chapman, um, often associated with the, uh, the group Mississippi uh, Sheiks. Uh, their famous song was Sitting on Top of the World. Um, Sam Chapman and other musicians sometimes talked about playing music in the uh, in the Mississippi Delta back in the 20s and 30s. Um, and, you know, there were, we often think, um, you know, the Delta is not as diverse as it, as it, as it is. Uh, and there were a lot of Italian families that, that settled in, in the Mississippi Delta. And, um, and a lot of blues musicians and other, others, um, you know, they learned, they played uh, a lot of Italian folk songs and dances in the delta i mean you know if you if you're a working musician and you're you want to get hired for parties you start learning things that people want to hear so if people hire you to do, play some italian music and you you learn it um so we often think of these people as only playing playing blues you know or like you're a country musician you only play country or you should only play rock and roll a lot of people their their repertoires are much broader uh, than what we often think of so there was a very interesting study um, that was done. Uh, it was headed by John Wesley Work III uh, and some of his colleagues and graduate students at Fisk University in Nashville uh, that they partnered with uh, Alan Lomax at the Library of Congress. Uh, they went to Coahoma County where uh, Clarksdale is in 1941 and 42. They went over two different summers and did a really fascinating uh, exploration of music in the Delta. So they found there part of this, part of the research was um, going around and asking people of different age groups, you know, just like, what are some of your favorite songs? Just let, like, let us know. Well, here's a list of songs listed as favorites by some of the older uh, uh, African-American folks in the, in the Delta. You can see these songs like God Bless America, Star Spangled Banner, You Are My Sunshine. Uh, you know, uh, there's, I'm not saying uh, this isn't a list filled with blues. Uh, this is 1941-42. So, you know, often when you're reading about people writing about uh, blues and they're talking about the Mississippi Delta, it's often described as sort of this remote back backwater area that's uh, isolated from the rest of the world. This study done in the early 40s shows that, no, I mean, people in the Delta were tuned in to other things that were happening. Take a look at this list of what younger informants thought was, uh, what, what some of their favorite songs were. Um, yeah, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, uh, My Wild Irish Rose. Yeah, not, not what you would expect uh folks to, to list as their favorite songs um really fascinating they also part of the study they looked at all of the contents of uh, jukeboxes in every club in clarksdale and so we know what people were listening to at this time and in this place um very fascinating study um so this is big jack johnson he was uh, sometimes known as the oil man uh from clarksdale mississippi um and he talks about growing up you know, they didn't, they weren't hearing blues on the radio waves. He said he, while he was, you know, a little boy, his, he would listen to his parents and they, you know, what they were listening to on the radio. And they were, uh, they were hearing a lot of country music. So here's the song, uh, one of his songs called I'm a Big Boy Now. And he talks about this a little bit. When I was a little boy, just so high. Mama took a little switch And she made me try I used to try to do like Some people's on the radio Roy Acum Johnny Cash Hank Snow Roy 
Rogers. Who's listening to all these popular country artists. And Gene Audrey. I used to try to look like those guys. Oh, you old little lady. She said, boy, I said, yeah, some mama. You can't do like them white folks on that radio. I said, yes, I can, mama. I said, I'm a big boy now. Hey, girl, I can do whatever I please. Your lady, your lady, your lady, your lady, your lady. <laughs> so it's Big Jack Johnson yodeling, uh, sort of in the style of um, uh, Jimmy Rogers, you know, I mean, all of his blue yodels, uh, uh, blue yodel number one, uh, T for Texas, all, all of those, uh, those songs, um, you know, there, but that's, um, uh, there are there's some blues artists that actually did went into that falsetto range a lot like Tommy Johnson and others did or something kind of similar to yodeling not necessarily uh, Jimmy Rogers style yodeling but there's that in a black tradition as well. Um, so BB King donated his personal record collection uh, to us here uh, in the blues archive uh, back in 82 and 83 he gave almost 8000 sound recordings of just uh, records that he uh, he had in his own collection. So we had a lot of blues and jazz and popular music artists, but the artist who um, he had the most records of is this guy, Django Reinhardt, um, who uh, often associated with like the hot club. Some people um, refer to this as uh, gypsy jazz. You know, we, um, that term isn't really used so much uh, anymore, uh, but that's the style of music uh, he played. Um, but he, uh, his style of playing often, you know, it's interesting because B.B. King usually solos, his soloing style is usually a single string. He's playing on one, one kind of string. That's very much the way uh, Django kind of played. Uh, very different styles, uh, but he had, Django Reinhardt had a very clear influence on B.B. Uh, King. Uh, so there are a lot of record labels uh, historically uh, around the state. Uh, Malico Records has been it's probably it's the top soul blues and southern soul record label uh, in the world, based in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Ace Records was also in Jackson. Uh, Fat Possum uh, is up here in, in Oxford. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting labels is the uh, Trumpet Records label. Uh, Trumpet was a record label based in Jackson, Mississippi uh, on Ferris Street. Uh, it was owned and run by this woman you see here, Lillian McMurray. Um, she was the first person to record a lot of very influential uh, and important blues artists, including people like Sonny Boy Williamson. This is uh, Sonny Boy Williamson too. Uh, in fact, we have, um, for the rest of this year of 2022, uh, uh, we have a, an exhibit all about Sonny Boy Williamson too up here in the Blues Archive. So uh, come, come check that out sometime if you get a chance. Um, but here's a scan of Sonny Boy Williamson's very first recording contract. Um, she was the first person to record Elmore James, sort of the, the, the king of electric uh, blues slide guitar playing. Um, Jerry Boogie McCain, Willie Love. She recorded some um, rockabilly and uh, um, uh, black gospel groups as well. Here's a little example. Of, uh, this is Sonny Boy Williamson. This is um, he brought life back to the dead. So then, uh, when I was on a battle, I didn't believe what you said. Oh, when I was on a battle, I didn't believe what you said. But I found out for myself She brought life back to the dead um, So actually, I, I just remember this. There, uh, the Delta Blues Museum in Clarksdale, I believe it's today, is their opening of a, uh, of a Trumpet Records um, exhibition. So this is a letter, this gives you a little insight into Lillian McMurray's uh, personality. She was a pretty dynamic woman. I'm gonna read this, I thought it's, it's so funny. 
So she's writing to uh, Lucky Joe Allman, one of her rockabilly artists, and um, she talks about a recording session they did and said, we are very disappointed on your slow tunes, Tanglewood Waltz, and I'd be better off without you. Your voice is cracked all through, you blast and then drop your voice, and the whole darn vocal comes out a mess. In the course of Tanglewood Waltz, you are especially bad. <laughs> Instead of blasting so loud on the high notes, why don't you soften up on your voice? Try singing your slow tune soft like your girl was standing right beside you instead of shouting at her across the cow pasture. You can sing the high notes, but don't raise your volume so uh, so that you blast. Um, yeah, and she goes on and she talks, uh, oh, this is this letter. This is one she's writing to uh, one of her other artists, artist, uh, Wally Dean. And she says, um, trying to get him back down to Jackson to do another demo. Um, she says, yeah, if you do so, let me get a few real musicians uh, to make some hot rock and roll demo tapes using hot drums, piano, bass, and guitar, and maybe a sax or two for kicks. I can get real musicians here. We do not want any pee-picking hillbillies or any billies, period. Uh, no steel guitars, please. Um, and then uh, I love this part. She says, Wally, you got to come up with something original. She says, please stay away from the words going to rock and or roll since they are worn out. Uh, pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> um, so Tommy T-Bone Pruitt here, he's uh, uh, from uh, Ellisville, Mississippi. So between Hattiesburg and, and Laurel. Years ago, I was talking to him and uh, he, was, he told me the story of playing at a talent show in Laurel. And he was upset because he came in second place. Well, he came in second place to Leontine Price. So... <laughs> um arguably like i mean one of the top five best uh opera singers that have ever lived in my <laughs> humble opinion uh so leontine price is uh from from laurel as well i mean my gosh the the impact she made on the opera world are absolutely stunning i mean she's had the first major uh role of uh, uh, an african-american lead role at the metropolitan opera also at um Milan's um, La Scala uh, uh, Opera House. Um, I think it was a Met performance that uh, she was, um, she received a 42 minute standing ovation, which is insane because um, now with all of our ADHD TikTok brands where we can only like one minute max, that's, that's as much attention span as we have. I mean, to applaud for 42, the length of 42 TikToks, that's insane. Um, but a uh, fascinating woman. Let me just play a brief example. This is Chio del Sonio from uh, Puccini's uh, La Ronde de Hate to hate to skip through that. Ah, it's so amazing. Um, uh, Mississippi's had some other uh, African American uh, opera stars. Uh, Ruby Elsey uh, is from uh, another uh, Pontotoc uh, musician. Um, she learned spirituals from her grandmother. Um, her grandmother was born into slavery. Uh, Ruby Elsey uh, attended Rust College uh, in Holly Springs, Mississippi. There was a visiting uh, professor from uh, the Ohio State University uh, who heard her singing uh, and just was walking and heard in one of the practice rooms, I think, and heard this voice like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. Uh, and got her a scholarship um, um, to uh, Ohio State. She graduated top of her class in music, uh, went on studied at Juilliard. Um, when George Gershwin was auditioning for his then brand new uh, Porgy and Bess, he immediately cast her in the role of uh, as uh, Serena. It's the second female uh, lead in the in the piece. Um, 
I, he only heard her do one song in the audition, like you're immediately cast. Um, so let me play a little sample here. <laughs> Um, the first African-American opera star was Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield. Uh, she was born into slavery uh, in Natchez, Mississippi in 1924. Uh, a Quaker woman who was named Elizabeth Greenfield uh, got her out of Natchez somehow, I don't know the details, got and took her up to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, when she was uh, an infant. Um, and um, even though music was sort of forbidden uh, by uh, the particular Quaker group that she was in, uh, the older uh, Greenfield woman, uh, Quaker woman who from Philadelphia, um, she recognized that this this little girl had a gift for music, and she enrolled her uh, in music lessons. Uh, she quickly began performing all over the Northeast. Um, she went uh, she went to London to her there. She studied with uh under the patronage of harriet beecher stowe she was given lessons with queen victoria's court organist um she performed at buckingham palace uh she earned the nickname uh the black swan um that her name black swan was taken by uh harry pace who was a former business partner with wc handy um and pace started a, a record company was the first successful uh african-american owned and operated record label called black swan records it was a harlem renaissance era uh record label recorded a lot of blues and some other other artists but it took took its name after uh, elizabeth taylor greenfield uh black swan so in uh there's an op operatic history in uh in mississippi this is this is photos of the uh, the opera house in meridian uh, Mississippi. This is the Grand Opera House uh, of Mississippi. It was built by German Jewish immigrants, uh, Marx and Rothenberg. Um, the Opera House there sort of operated from 1890 to 1927. Uh, on opening night, they performed uh, Johann Strauss's The Gypsy Baron. Uh, so in addition to like high art, like opera, um, there were also, uh, here's a program of uh, uh, Puccini's uh, Tosca performed <laughs> there in Meridian. Um, it's sort of, uh, uh, there were a lot of minstrel shows that were performed here as well. So if you know about the tradition of blackface minstrelsy, you know, this was a tradition dating back to the 1820s where white performers initially would, as a sort of parody and mimicry of African-American entertainment styles would put on blackface um and engage in exaggerated dialect and things like this and all these minstrel shows um uh, took off this is a photo of one of the trucks from the rabbit foot minstrels this was a touring group from they were based at one point at port gibson in mississippi um this was the most popular form of entertainment um in america in the 1800s by far um, when you look at a lot of these examples of minstrel songs and uh just especially to modern sensibilities the, even then uh there's no deny i mean it's extremely racist and offensive uh material um here's a photo of the inside of the restored uh opera house it's now the riley center uh and meridian a lot of touring acts perform here I, in my opinion it's the most beautiful uh theater in the state it's absolutely gorgeous um so you know there's a classical music tradition around the state there were a number of colleges that no longer exist um it's mississippi female college um in uh, philadelphia in all of these schools every single one of them had course offerings in music uh port gibson female college you can see best advantages in music elocution and art uh Shukalak female college um had a music department <laughs> Um, Starkville Female Institute, you know, and they list the music, music faculty here. Uh, this Union Female College, this was in Oxford, Mississippi. This is their, one of their uh, bulletins. You can see 
some of the programs that they had, and some of the offerings. You can see the course studies that were that were offered in these schools. A lot of these are just standard classical kind of uh, education um, methodology for the time. Uh, here's a photo of the group, the all female uh, musical group. A lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, musical configuration, guitars, mandolins, uh, violins. Um, this is one of their programs. You see a lot of standard repertoire. I mean, Mendelssohn, Schubert, Verdi, Strauss, Haydn, Weber, Liszt. Um, uh, this is the Meridian Female College, and this is pretty fascinating. A, this is a pretty large school. I mean, they're... Um, Look at the conservatory of music here. I mean, they said it's the largest at the time. This was the largest in the South, uh, having enrolled over 475 people in all branches of music. Um, yeah, they also uh, they advertise in the uh, so on here it was it was in here. You know, they talk about that you could they actually have hot water in the uh, in the dorms there. So that's a be a big selling point, I imagine. Uh, here's members of their orchestra um at the time pretty pretty fascinating again a lot of some of the programs that were being done a lot of standard standard classical romantic uh era repertoire um william grant still african-american composer from uh, woodville mississippi let me just play a little example of his uh snippet from his afro-american symphony uh, he was the first African-American composer to have an opera produced by the New York City Opera. I uh, studied at Oberlin Conservatory, and studied with uh, George Whitfield Chadwick and Edgar Varez. Um, Varez was one of uh, Frank Zappa's uh, idols as a child, which is very, uh, I was friends with Langston Hughes. You can see he's, he's incorporating a lot of African-American spirituals into his classical stuff. Um, Milton Babbitt. Um, He's born in Pennsylvania, but raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, he is one of the most important early sort of experimental 20th century avant-garde uh, composers. He experimented a lot with some of the early, earliest um, keyboard synthesizers. He did a lot of electronic music, did things with tape splicing. So here's a little example. It's, it's uh, for a lot of folks, you're gonna find this a little strange. But really pushing the envelope, pushing the boundary of what uh, what what's considered music. This guy spent all of his childhood in in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> so, um, so speaking of strange uh, experimental music, uh, this I, I discovered her a few years ago. Judy Dunaway, she's from Macomb, Mississippi. She does all of this music with balloons. Let me play a little snippet. So she's letting the air out of the balloon, but changing the size of her mouth to change the pitch. Very, very uh, avant-garde sort of experimental things. There's all kinds of interesting things. Uh, there's a lot of clips of uh, her doing different experimental music on, uh, on YouTube. Um, so um, John Luther Adams uh, was born in uh, Meridian. Um, his orchestral piece, Become Ocean, was awarded the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for music. Um, he spent most of his life, I guess, adult life in Alaska, I think. One of his, uh, one of his choral compositions, mimicking a lot of uh, certain bird calls. Um, some other fascinating groups. So getting out of looking at in jazz, um, there was this uh, group based out of the uh, the Piney Woods School, um, which is just south of Jackson on the way down on like Highway 49, heading down toward uh, Hattiesburg. Uh, this school was started basically as a school for um, African-American uh, students. Uh, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm started as the, they were the first racially integrated uh, all-female jazz band in the world um, based out of the Piney Wood School. They initially started as a fundraising sort of arm for the school. They performed concerts all over the U.S., 
raise money uh, for the school. Um, here's a little snippet of them. Running out of time, so I'm going to skip through some things really quickly. Uh, the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi also started there at the Piney Woods School before the uh, school. Um, I think it's the School for the Blind, maybe, and it's in Jackson, Mississippi now. Uh, moved there. It used to be at the uh, Piney Woods School. Um, so this guy, um, this is, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally drawing a blank. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Arthur Palmer Hudson, that's on the slide, sorry. Um, he was a student here at the University of Mississippi and also uh, taught here for a time. And he did a lot of folklore research. He was collecting examples of folk songs. Uh, he would ask his students to get their grandparents to sing them some folk songs uh, and write down the songs and do your best job at transcribing the music for it. Uh, he collected over like 30 examples of different variations on the old Scottish uh, song, Barbara Allen. Um, I can talk more about variations in folk music if you'd like, but I'm going to skip through that a bit. Um, here's some posters we have for some um, uh, for an event, a fiddle contest in Grenada. Uh, you can see uh, here some of the prizes. I thought these were kind of funny. Uh, for the best fiddler, a suit of clothes. For the second best fiddler, a handsome pair of shoes. <laughs> There's some pretty funny ones on, in this list. Uh, for the laziest fiddler, it's choice between an axe or a hoe. <laughs> uh, I, I think a lot of this is just tongue in cheek, but <laughs> um, here's a photo. Uh, this was taken by Martha Alice Stewart. She was the head nurse at Parchman Penitentiary, Mississippi State State Prison. Um, she was the head nurse in the 1930s. Her family donated uh, a lot of her photos that she took of scenes around Parchman uh, to us about 10 years ago or so. And this is a photo of one of the bands uh, in the 1930s. Uh, there's a lot I could talk to you about this, but uh, some later wardens kind of reinstated uh, the Parchman Band, and they actually produced some records. Um, this one, I don't know what they're, I mean, this is, it's so strange, calling this album Good Old Cons, and they have this bizarre thing. It's almost like it's a photo of an inmate hot wiring the warden's truck, or something. I don't know what's going on in the scene. It's 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 a very bizarre thing, but uh, but Wendell Cannon, uh, the warden there, I mean, he really found that if arts were introduced, if if inmates had something positive and creative to do, it really cuts down on incidents of violence. Um, it it's just the well being of everyone there in, involved. It's it's exponentially better. Uh, people have something positive to do with your day. Um, it's a lot I could talk to you about this, um, but uh, this is a group, the, the Fabulous Red Tops. They were a dance band from Vicksburg, Mississippi. They played at dances and proms all over the South. Uh, their band leader um, and drummer, Walter Osborne, donated all of their records to the archive uh, years ago, about 20, uh, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, well, I don't have time to play an example right now, but he kept detailed records of every gig they played, how much they were paid, uh, so if you're interested in double entry bookkeeping and uh, music, it's a fascinating collection for you. So I have uh, shape note traditions in the state as well. Um, this was a style of singing, uh, of teaching people how to sing and how to read music, where this is sort of incorporating, uh, marrying solfege, sort of singing with uh, symbols. So the note heads on this, you can see on the music, they're diamonds and squares. Those corresponded to a fa so la, you know, in a in a singing system to help you learn how to sight read better. Um, it's just a brief snip of one of the African American uh, note uh, traditions. When you first sing this, everybody sings the the fa so la, you know, syllables as you're getting in your head, and then you sing the words and come back to it. Um, so we often think of things, you know, we're thinking in sort of black and white thinking and thinking of uh, 
when we think about Mississippi, we're not thinking broader of so many of the other rich cultures that are part of our state. This is a photo from uh, Magnolia Grove Monastery uh, uh, in the Batesville area. Uh, this is a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist monastery in the lineage of the late Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, and here's a chant. One of the nuns. Uh, a lot of Vietnamese uh, monks and nuns uh, live here at the monastery. Để rơi những giọt sương trời lạc đác Tây phương ra trời là suối những... um, So here's a little video snippet. This is part of the new Taliban community. This is sort of an offshoot of like Hinduism um, down in um, South, South Mississippi. So this is uh, devotional sort of praise music. Um, so I don't know if you ever had a chance to, uh, if you've listened to uh, the program, the Mississippi Public Broadcasting produced program, Sounds Jewish, that's uh, broadcast. Um, um, uh, maybe uh, Public Radio International, I can't remember, but it, it's broadcast beyond just our state. Um, um, so this is a, a Hanukkah event several years ago up in North Mississippi that I played music at. Um, but yeah, there's so many traditions beyond what people initially think of when you're thinking about Mississippi. Um, skip over a few, that's Cedric Burnside, uh, their recent Grammy winner. Um, so there's also like, uh, this is the, the punk metal band, the Cooters from uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, in a recent issue of uh, Mississippi Folklife, there's a whole article on uh, Mississippi's sort of punk scene. Um, this is uh, Judy and the Jerks, uh, <laughs> but uh, featured there from Hattiesburg. Uh, group the Tangents, um, played all over the Delta and in Oxford. This is an Oxford band that's no longer around, but they, some of the members went on to perform form uh, Widespread Panic, for instance. Uh, there's the, the fan from the North Mississippi Hill Country Picnic uh, featuring R.L. Burnside on the front. It's an Oxford group, bass drum of death. <laughs> so it's not just all, uh, you know, blues and country music uh, and gospel music in the state. Uh, Meridian Underground music. Uh, uh, I played in a metal band there years ago. Uh, I also played with a little jazz group there years ago, back when I was uh, in high school and community college. But they're you know, there's an active Mississippi Academy of Ancient Music that specializes in Renaissance, you know, medieval Renaissance and Baroque era music. Um, this is a group I often perform with, the uh, Mockingbird Early Music Ensemble, um, playing a lot of uh, Renaissance and early Baroque music. There are a number of uh, orchestras around the state. I, I play bass with the North Mississippi Symphony, but um, you all hopefully get a chance to, uh, if you haven't already seen them, the Gulf Coast Symphony, uh, some of their upcoming programming. Um, a lot of festivals around the state. This weekend, there's the Double Decker Festival here in Oxford. It's also the Juke Joint Festival over in Clarksdale. It's Jimmy Rogers Festival coming right up. Uh, Celtic Fest in Jackson um, uh, in June this year uh, that I've, I've been playing at since 98 or so. <laughs> So if you don't remember anything else uh, from my talk today, I just want you to go take away the idea that Mississippi, uh, our musical traditions are much more diverse than just blues, country, and rock and roll. Um, you know, and it, it's not just black or white. There are cult multiple cultures, um, multiple religions, uh, and musical traditions from all of those featured throughout our state. So with that in mind, uh, this concludes the formal part of my talk, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have about, about music. I don't really have any questions. Just thank you. This has been really interesting. Oh, you're very welcome. And, you know, I mean, I was obviously speeding through so much because, I mean, you could see how, how quickly I was going. 
um, I just tried, I wanted to fit everything right into that hour time frame. And, um, you know, this, this just gives you a, just a taste of our, our state's, you know, diverse musical heritage. Um, I also, I, it was great. There was a lot I wasn't expecting, a lot that was surprising. Um, but as a question, is there, are there any resources for anyone who wants to, to dive into Mississippi's musical history a little bit more that you can recommend? Sure. Um, so for, you know, some of the big, uh, some places to start on the, some obvious places in my mind for, like if you're interested in blues, for instance, check out the Mississippi Blues Trail. Check out their website, msbluestrail.org, I think. Uh, check that out. Check out the Country Music Trail. Um, those are good places to give you some, a good introduction to some of those. Uh, so you can see, you know, quite a range of blues artists all over, all over the state. Uh, you can read more about them, see the text that's written on those markers and maybe hopefully plan a trip to visit some of those, those communities. So if you're making a, uh, perhaps for folks, if you're wanting to uh, go on vacation, uh, uh, somewhere in the state look at one of these trail marker sites and see what some of like the areas where you're going to be going and see what places might be along the way. Cause maybe you didn't realize that one of these artists that's your favorite that you've listened to for years, you know, lived in Rolling Fork, Mississippi or uh, Philadelphia for, or, you know, wherever, you know, and maybe you want to stop by and see something of significance uh, to them. So those are good places to start. There are a number of, uh, uh, museums uh, and archives in the state certainly uh for blues you know come see us here in the blues archive at the university of mississippi but also there's the mississippi arts and entertainment experience museum in meridian uh, it's broader than just music i mean it's it's looking at entertainment in all forms you know dance visual arts music filmmaking acting um that's a great place to get a good overall kind of view of, of the arts and entertainment uh, in, in, from, and around the state. Uh, there's the Mississippi Grammy Museum in Cleveland. That's an excellent place to visit. Um, multiple blues museums uh, in the, the Mississippi Delta, the Highway 61 Blues Museum in Leland. Uh, while you're there, you go, you know, see birthplace of Kermit the Frog. <laughs> and uh, uh, also the Delta Blues Museum. Um, in Clarksdale, uh, so many others. I, I know I'm leaving leaving places off. Sorry, friends, <laughs> uh, but there, there, there's a lot. Uh, we have a lot of rich traditions. Um, those are those are just a few few places for that folks could visit around the state. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, did you have any closing thoughts? Any other questions? No. Well, thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Um, it's been eye-opening, and this is going to be a great resource for folks who, who couldn't make it. We'll have it on our YouTube channel. Great. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me.